We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I, I plan, I hope to, I should, I will finish chapter 9 today. We have been looking through this for a few weeks now. Paul has just explained to us in last week's message uh, his number one objective in ministry, his number one goal in ministry, and that is to win as many people as possible to faith in Jesus Christ. That's his purpose, that's his plan, that's his goal, that's what he lives for, to win people to Jesus Christ, as many as he possibly can. Uh, he wants to preach the gospel, he wants the gospel of Jesus Christ, he wants to preach the, the cross of Christ, he wants to preach that Jesus died for sins, and that be what he preaches all the time to everyone everywhere. And he also has shared with us his primary strategy to achieve that goal, and that is by becoming all things to all men. Now, that was a, a lot of stuff in there and a lot to re review if we were to, going to review it all. But he wants to become all things to all men that by all possible means he might win some to Christ. He's willing to cross over the barriers and be what people need to be so that there's nothing that hinders the gospel coming from his lips to their ears that they may hear Christ and believe and be saved. Um. There are indeed many, more, indeed many more things we could explore as we would study evangelism and evangelism strategies and evangelism methods. Uh, but that's another sermon, another day, another rabbit tra chase that I'm not going to do today. I would rather just go and continue Paul thought, Paul's thought in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse, starting in verse 24. He says, uh, through verse 27, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. But they do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself might, will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul challenges the Corinthians and us using this powerful, I think it's powerful, illustration, a metaphor to make the point that the Christian life, the life that we live in Christ, we come to Christ by believing in him, we look to him and we believe what he did on the cross was to save us from our sins. You're a sinner, you need salvation, so you look to Jesus and say, save me, Jesus. You died for me. Let your blood apply to me. But that brings us into another realm of existence. The Holy Spirit comes and lives in us, and we start to live, by that point, for the rest of our lives, the Christian life. And that Christian life, Paul's making the, the point here, is not a cakewalk. It's not something easy. It's, it's an exercise. It's a rather rigorous exercise, if you will. It, it involves us having perseverance it involves determination, it involves self-denial, it involves self-control. And Paul's metaphor to teach all those things to us today is a race. Paul makes the Christian, rate, a Christian life, a Christian, uh, the way we live our lives as Christians, a race. And this would be something easy for all the Corinthians to understand. In fact, all the Greeks would understand. He says in verse 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? but only one gets the prize, run in such a way as to get the prize. Every three years in Greece, ancient Greece, they would have these games. The Olympic Games were in Athens, and the Isthmian Games were in Corinth. And they would have all kinds of athletes that would compete for prizes in all kinds of different uh, field and track events. And the most popular of those field and track events was the race, the foot race. They would race. A bunch of competitors would get start and they'd hear the gun or whatever the start signal was back in those days and they would run as fast as they could to the other side. That was very popular, wildly popular. And the word race comes from the word stadia in Greek. Uh, we get our English word stadium from it. It was about 100, and, it's just a word that means a measurement. It's about 192 meters or about 600 feet. Uh, the same words used several times. One is when the two disciples were walking together at the day Jesus was resurrected to the Emmaus, 
and it says they walked about seven miles at 60 stadia. 60 times 600, whatever my, a mile is. That's about how far they walked. You know what I'm saying? But, but that's what a race was, a stadia. And so that became the distance that the race was, about 600 feet, 192 meters, about an eighth of a mile. And those, so they would build a stadium around the track and invite all the guests to come and enjoy this, uh, this event. People would come and sit around and watch it. And you have these runners running the race. Now, the runners running the way, race were not running just to have fun. And they weren't running just to see if they could make it to the end. They weren't there just to see if they could do it. Every runner in that competition, everyone trying to win, trying to race, was racing to win the race. Nobody was just racing just to have a good time, although I'm sure there were some guys that had a good time, like a football player. He's working his tail off, but he's having fun out there doing it. They race to win, and all of the contestants race to win. And out of all the contestants racing to win, only one of them could win. You didn't have a second place. Or if you had a second place, he was the first loser. And everybody else was a loser. You can't say that in our day. Everyone gets a participation trophy. But back in those days, you didn't get a participation trophy. Only one person gets to take home the prize. Only one person gets the reward. Only one person gets victory. And it was usually a crown or a wreath or a trophy or some kind of money, a purse. Same kind of idea is used by Paul in Philippians chapter 3, 13 and 14. He says, one thing I do, forgetting what is, is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. It's a prize that you're after. You're running a race, not just to run the race and have a good time, but you're running the way, race to win, and that's the Christian life. You're trying to win this race. This is the kind of imagery that Paul uses other places too. Galatians 2. He was, uh, went to Jerusalem to go visit some of the apostles. And James, he wanted to talk to them. He said, I did this privately. Uh, Galatians 2.2. 2, I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. He sees his own life as an apostle or his own life as a Christian as a race that he's running. And he wants to make sure he's doing it the right way. So he had to confirm with the other apostles in Jerusalem. Galatians chapter 5, he says to them, verse 7, You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? The Galatians were running a race. Their Christian life, their life by faith in Jesus Christ is a race. Philippians chapter 2, verse 16, he says, As you hold out the word of life, talking to them about their life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. I want you Philippians to hold out the word of life and live your life persevering in the faith of Jesus Christ so I know that my life wasn't a waste. I was running, and I was running the race. And it was a worthy thing. I didn't do it for nothing. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, in chapter 12, verse 1, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. Our Christian life is a race. It's a race, which means by the word race, just, the, just when you say race, you mean I want to win the race. I'm not just here to get a trophy. I'm not just getting a participation trophy. Nobody gets applause and nobody gets cheers for finishing second place. Paul says to run. Now this is an imperative verb in the Greek. It's a command. You run the race. You run it. You're not jogging. You're not just tagging along. You're running this race. You're running the life uh, as a Christian, as a race. And he says, run it in such a way. The word means in like manner. In the way, in this, in this way. Run it in this way. Here's how you run the race. To get the prize. You want to get the prize. You're, you're longing to get the prize. You want the victory. You move as quickly as you can. As fast as your feet will move. You run to win. You run to get the victory. That's the Christian life. Now Paul's not saying 
by this text that all of us here are in a contest with each other and only one of us is going to win. It wouldn't be me, I'm certain of that. He's not talking about each one of us are competing with each other to win the race. He's saying that all of us, each one of us, and all of us together, and each one of us separately and individually are running a race. We're living our Christian life. Each one of us is living his life in Christ, following Christ, obeying Christ's commands, growing in his grace, growing in knowledge, maturing in the faith, winning as many lost people as you can possibly win to Christ, as many as you can, and all of the other aspects, there's probably spend all sermon just listing all the different things that are aspects and elements of living a Christian life. All of those things involved as living as a Christian, each one of us ought to run that race as if we were trying to win the race. Not just trying to jog along. Not just trying to enjoy being in the, in the, on the field. But we want to win. That's Paul's analogy. That's Paul's metaphor here. Uh, and I haven't watched NASCAR very much in the last few years, maybe a race or two or part of a race or two, but I used to be addicted to it fiercely, and Jeff Gordon was my favorite driver. And all my people who didn't like Jeff Gordon and loved Dale Earnhardt would make fun of me and say, oh, Jeff Gordon's just a whiner. He just whines all the time. And one day I was watching a race. He, was, he came in second. By the way, he finished second 64 times. He won 94 times, finished 60, second 64 times. But he was, he was gaining on Dale Earnhardt. Dale Earnhardt won the race. Jeff Gordon had the fastest car. Uh, three laps to go, he was right on his tail. Two laps to go, he was trying to pass him. He couldn't pass him. If he had a lap or two or go, he probably would have passed him. But he didn't pass him, and so they're interviewing Jeff Gordon after the race, and he's whining. And it was perfect. It was the perfect... Uh, Picture everybody, oh, he's just a whiner. And this is what he said when he was whining. He goes, uh, I hate losing. I hate losing. And you go, what the perfect athlete, the perfect competitor. He hates losing the, game, the race. He doesn't want to finish second. He wants the victory. Think about it. You cannot be happy if you're Jeff Gordon or any of those guys for that matter to get a participation trophy. You want to win. You want to spin out your tires, all that stuff. You don't get a participation trophy. You don't get applause. You don't get cheers. You don't get a prize just for entering the race. Being Jesus' disciple requires total effort. Being Jesus' disciple um, requires all out, full blast, leave nothing on the table, 110%, as fast as you can go, you ever watch, you know, you watch the competitors when they're, um, the game's over and the reporters interviewing them after the race. They use all these terms to mean that same thing. You just give it all you got. You give it all you got, all the way, all the way, full blast, all the way until you win. And if you don't win, you still say, I gave it all I had. I was trying to win the race. Now, I do want to say something about endurance and perseverance. You do have to finish the race. The Christian life is a marathon, if you will. You have to run it all the way to the very end. You don't give up and you don't drop out. You run the race. You keep on going. You, have, you believe in Jesus Christ. You call on Jesus to save you. And you call on him tomorrow too. And the next day too. And the next day too. Until you don't breathe anymore. It's a persevering race. You last until the very end. You keep going. You straining toward, like Paul says, I strain toward, I forget what's behind, and strain ahead toward the goal. Pressing on. He says in chapter 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So there is a whole other sermon about perseverance and enduring and lasting the rest of your life, all your life, Living the Christian life by faith in Christ. Perseverance. But that's not Paul's metaphor here. His metaphor is, we're talking about some serious racing. You want to win this race. You don't want to just finish the race. You want to win the race. You finish by finishing first. And that takes serious dedication. 
That takes serious commitment and serious consequential action. If you're committed to win the race, it requires you to do stuff about that. And he adds this, uh, another element in his illustration, verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. NIV says everyone competing in the games. It's a um, participle, a verb, a Greek verb, agonizomai. We get our English word agony from it. The word means to struggle. The word means to fight, to strive, to labor, to engage in a contest. And in the context, it's obviously an athletic contest. He's talking about athletes who struggle to win. All the competitors struggling, all the competitors striving, all the athletes who are racing to win the race, every single one of them, all of them, goes into what they call here strict training. The word means to control yourself, controlling your desires and your actions, exercising self-control. All the athletes who are racing in this race in order to win this race goes into strict self-control training. They get ready for the game. They train. They lift weights until it hurts. They lift weights until it hurts. It's like they're straining to get that last rep in there, and then they stop. Then they go do it five or six more times in the same day. Some more reps. Rest a little bit, do some more reps. They uh, practice feverishly. They practice the same move over and over again. So when the game comes, they'll know how to play it. They'll know what to do. They deny themselves all the goodies that might distract them or weaken them. They eat a strict diet, healthy food. No, no pizza. No ice cream. No cheesecake. Uh, I think... Uh, it's like Rocky Balboa in the Rocky movie, movie. This dude had to train just to get himself looking like that so he could play that, play the part. Much less actually, actually fight. You, you train. You train hard. You train hard all the time so you can win. This is about self-control. You work the muscles that you have that you need to use in order to win the race. You deny yourself the things that will diminish your chance of winning. You, winning. you work out the things that you know you need to work out so you can win, and you deny yourself the things that you have to deny, that think that things that might make you not win. You never see fat runners. That's why I'm not a runner. But you never see fat runners. And that's the metaphor Paul's using for the Christian life. It's a life of self-control. And some Christians don't win the race because they don't have any self-control. They have no spiritual discipline at all in their lives. This is, the, this is a, a lot of Christians. They're racing the race. They're, they're persevering to the end. Bless their heart. They're serious. They really have called on Jesus. But they haven't thought of it as a race to win. They just thought of it as a jog. Or stop and get your breath, or take a break, or relax. Don't wear yourself out. Don't burn out. You've heard that one. I don't want to burn out. Yeah, you do want to burn out. If you're going to win the race, you've got to burn out. You race until the finish line. Straining every last bit of it. You've got to stay balanced, they say. Anything but really wanting to win. There are a lot of Christians that live their Christian life just wanting to exist in it and live in it, but they haven't thought about it as a race to win. And Paul's saying it's a race. You've got to win. You have to do things. You have to exercise self-control. Do things that will help you be more godly and stop doing things, not doing things, that will stifle your holiness. I just want to... Um, throw out a few of them at you. There are things, there are spiritual disciplines that you need to do in order to win in this Christian life, in order to become a truly uh, mature disciple of Jesus and win the race. Now, each one of these things would require its own sermon, but I'm going to give a really hardcore nutshell version of it. First one is, read your Bible. 
Everybody here has a Bible? I got about 10 of them. Got 25 of them on my Bible software. All kinds of versions. The latest and the greatest. You have to read your Bible regularly. You have to read your Bible daily as much as you can and read your, all, your whole Bible. Read all of it. Carve out a discipline in your life, a, day of your, a, de, a time of your day, part of your day, somewhere in that day, probably in the morning. I don't know if it's in the morning for everybody. Not everybody's a morning person. But somewhere in your, in your day, you want to open God's Word, the Bible, and hear God speak to you by reading the Bible. Memorizing verses, challenging yourself to uh, put it into practice. Not just reading it, but it'll say something that God wants you to be. Say, Lord, I want to be like this. And challenge yourself to do it, apply it, and put it to your heart and do it. Make notes. That's a spiritual discipline that if you do, I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure, it will help motivate you to want to win the race. Not just jog along, but win it. Two, you want to pray. When I mean pray, I mean pray regularly, pray daily. And I don't mean just pray when you think about it. Too many of us just pray when we think about it. We pray. We don't pray like we ought to pray, but we pray. But it's only when something comes up. If someone says, pray for me, you go, okay. And then you pray for them for five seconds, and then you don't pray anymore the rest of the day. No, this is a spiritual discipline where you pray. And this prayer, I mean, you make a list. Get you out a piece of paper. Or get out your phone. There's an app called Prayer Mate. You can make you a list, a very detailed list. Things you need. Ask, things you want to ask God for that you need. Things that you want to ask God to do for you. Things that you want uh, God to do. People that you want God to save. People that you want God to help. People that you want God to heal. People that you want God to bless. Put their names on a list so you can open it up and look at them every day and pray for those people for that thing. Or you can at least do uh, that, least, that list on like a rotating basis. Not that you have a, you might have a list that would take you five hours to go through. Put it on a rotation. Pray for these people on Monday, these people on Tuesday, these people on Wednesday. Things like that. But you need to have a regular discipline, a regular self-control of praying to God for what you need and what you want. It'd be like you're trying to win a race or something. And that's exercising. That's practicing self-control. Exercising self-control by disciplining yourself to stop doing what you're doing. Stop thinking about the other stuff that's that are going on in your lives. Stop getting distracted by everyday stuff and pray. Pray about everything. Here's another one. Make Christian fellowship a priority. Come to church on Sunday. Come to church on Wednesday. We have Wednesday night service here. I teach a really good Bible story, Bible lesson, uh, drama of redemption. Come. Be with fellow. Be with us. Look for other opportunities to study the Bible or, or just hang out with other, other saints. I mean, don't you enjoy just hanging out and being with the other saints and looking at them in the face and giving them a hug and encouraging them and serving them and all the things that you would do with other saints? Especially the ones that go to church with you, right? Y'all are my favorites. I love other saints too. That I like them too. Y'all are my favorites. I want to hang out with y'all. That should be a regular discipline of your life. It's like going to the gym with somebody else. You go by yourself, you work out, you don't really work out hard, you're ready to go home. You work out with someone else and they're going, do another one. Lift it one more time. Come on, come on, you can do it, you can, ain't right, ain't that right. Keep on going. It's, I'm serious. You train with other people. It will help you think about winning the race. Here's another one. Find, search for, seek for areas where you can serve those very saints that you like to hang out with and be with and fellowship with. A ministry opportunity. 
And you commit to those ministry opportunities by using your spiritual gifts, filling in the slots wherever the slot's needed, plugging in where it's needed, doing the work, volunteering to, do, to help do stuff that needs to be done in the church. There are ministries in the church that you can volunteer to do and serve. That's a regular uh, exercise of self-control. Serving others and serving the church, not what you want to do, but what, what needs to be done, you help. In fact, I think you'll find out that that'll be something that you actually want to do, that you actually like doing when you serve. You encourage the brothers and sisters around you. It will strengthen you as if you were trying to win a race by serving others. Uh, here's another one. It's also church-related, and it's individual. Uh, you do this at church. You do this by yourself when you're at home, like reading your Bible and praying by yourself at your home. At home. Just devote yourself to actual, real, genuine uh, worshiping the Lord. Just worship. Praise Him. Thank, thank Him. Make your list as part of your prayer time of just the things that you want to thank Him for. And as you start to thank Him, you'll start to worship Him. You'll start to praise Him. You'll find you a song to sing. You can sing that song with all of us here together on Sunday. Or you can sing that song by yourself in your closet. Or in the car, a worship song of just praising God and thanking Him and, and just singing Him. Let that be your regular habit. A habit of worshiping the Lord. A self-controlling, exercising control of yourself just to say, I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to worship Him. I'm going to thank Him. I'm going to think of more things to thank Him for. And as you think of Him and think of more things to thank Him for, it'll be like you're trying to win a race. Think of all the things that God is good to you about. How is God good to you? A couple of things. I bet you could spend all day long thanking Him and praising Him and worshiping Him. And you do that when you're not in the mood. In fact, that's the way you do all of these uh, spiritual disciplines, all the self-control. It's what you do when you're not even in the mood to do it. And then you go, well, doesn't God want me to have a heart that loves him? Yeah, he does, but he wants you to be disciplined to run the race to win it. That's what this is about. I think this one's in context, context of chapter 9. Uh, share Christ with lost people. Witnessing. Telling others the gospel. You know the gospel. You get saved. If you're, are you saved? You got saved, you called on Jesus Christ to save you of your sin. You saw that you were a sinner and, uh, and set up for God's judgment, his condemnation, his wrath. And you saw that Jesus died for you on the cross and you believed him and you called on him. Seriously, you have enough information where you can take that and give it to somebody else who doesn't know him and who was lost. Regularly, systematically. Sharing the gospel with those who are lost. I'm telling you what, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. It will grow you into a runner trying to win the race. It's a self-discipline. It's a self-controlling spiritual discipline to share the gospel with someone that's lost. You'll start running like you're, you see the finish line coming and you're trying to beat the guy beside you. Here's another one. I could go on and on. I'm going to do a few more, a couple more. This is uh, when I, I guess they call it stewardship. Stewardship. Talked about this a few weeks ago in chapter 9. Giving. Invest your financial resources into God's kingdom for Christ's glory. And not just your giving of your financial resources, your money, but giving of your time. Investing your time. Not wasting your time. Not being lazy, doing things that are not kingdom-focused. It's a time management stewardship and a financial management stewardship for God's glory. You want to win this thing. It's a race you want to win. Here's one more. Uh, some of these, some people find easier than other ones. Uh, I would say discipline your mind or discipline... Um, Knowledge. Learn Christian doctrine. Learn systematic theological truth. Gain knowledge in the faith. 
That's a spiritual discipline. That's a spiritual exercise that will help you win the race. Knowing Christian truth, knowing Christian doctrine, knowing Christian theology. Strengthen your mind. Read some good theological books, some good commentaries. I'm, I'm, it'll make you think of the race as a race not just to jog on, but a race to run in so that you win. There are others. There's some good books you can read on spiritual disciplines that will help you focus where you can become a better disciple of Jesus Christ, uh, where you become focused on uh, trying to equip yourself to win first place. Now, there are also some negative disciplines that I'll need to work on too, but I'm going to get to those later. Because I want to do verse 20, rest of verse 25. It says, they do it. They, they go into a fierce regimen of training. They exercise self-control. They do it. The athletes do it. Those who compete in the race, they do it to get a crown that will not last. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. Crown is the prize. From verse 24, race to win the prize, race to win. Only one gets the prize. This is the prize. It's a crown. And the word crown is, I love it. I, I only do this when there's an English word that goes with it. Stephanos. We get our, if your name's Stephen, it means crown. In the games, the winners would get a wreath. Sometimes it'd be a wreath plated with gold. It was a crown that you put on your head. Sometimes they plate it with gold or some other precious metal, uh, and you'd wear it for a while. Then after you stopped wearing it for a while, you put it on a display case or on the mantle or something like that. And if you had that crown and you wore it around, it was prestige. It's like you were a rock star in town. Everybody wanted to come and see you and get your autograph and hang out with you. It made you feel good. You got something, you got some credibility with people because you won the race. You got the crown. You got the prize. You got the trophy. But eventually it wears out. Falls apart. Even in your trophy case, it falls apart. It starts to rust. It doesn't last forever. This human realm that Paul's making that illustration, in the human realm, the athletes race for a crown, but it doesn't last forever. It's temporal. It's a short-lived glory. And the glory and the prestige that go with it is short-lived too. Because next year, someone faster than you is going to win it, and they'll totally forget about you. Unless you make it to the Hall of Fame. And then they forget about you when the next guy gets in the Hall of Fame. Until you get old and then they bring you on the field so they can, they can uh, glory in all the old guys. We'll show a few highlight films of it. But even that doesn't last. It doesn't last. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4.8, Physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for the present life and the life to come. The, the crown that Paul is challenging us to win by coming in first, by winning the race, is an eternal, permanent crown. That's the prize. A crown that will not fade out, or fade away, or rot, or rust, or any of those things. A permanent, eternal crown. This is the prize. Now, he used a different word here than he does prize in verse 24, but it's the same thing. He's talking about the crown. Now, a lot of people have tried to speculate, or a lot of people have given good thoughts of what this crown is. What, what crown are you talking about, Paul? Is this a real crown? Uh, probably not a real crown that you're going to get to wear around in heaven. It might be. I don't know. But there are a few thoughts about it. Uh, for 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, I read verse 7 earlier. He says, now there, hey, I fought the, fought, I fought the fight, finished the race. He says, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. I guess just for fighting the fight, winning the race. Lasting to the end, finishing it. A crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also all who have longed for his appearing. It's like you're just waiting for Jesus. You're hoping Jesus comes back. You're longing for him to come back and save you and rescue you from this present evil age. You say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Everyone who... Get, everyone who lives that way, 
gets a crown of righteousness. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 4, when the chief shepherd appears, talking about elders, elders, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Elders who serve faithfully because they want to, not because they have to, not for money, not for gain, but because they desire to serve Christ by loving his people and serving his people, teaching his people, they get the crown of glory. James 1, 2, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, stood the test he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So, a lot of different views about what this crown is that you're racing the wind for. This is not the crown that you get by just believing in Jesus. That's eternal life that you get by looking to him and calling on him and coming to him and crying out to him for mercy. Everyone who cries to him for mercy gets mercy and gets eternal life. You have your sins forgiven. This is something I believe different. Uh, the ESV study Bible calls it the fullness of blessings and rewards in the age to come. Whatever that means. The fullness of blessings and rewards in the age to come. MacArthur study Bible, Christ's likeness in heaven. A different, another commentator says, the reward faithful believers will receive at the judgment seat of Christ. Whatever the crown is, you're going to get a reward, a crown for winning the race. You came in first place and you won the race and you get a crown. You get some kind of reward, some kind of blessing. MacArthur also calls this uh, the prize is a salvation of souls. And I said this last week. If you were the instrument of leading people to Christ, if you just went out and witnessed to people and you got to see people come to Christ, that's someone that you get to share eternity with and you were the one that brought them. I don't know what that feels like, but it's going to be great. It's going to be a crown. It's going to be a reward. It's going to be a prize. Winning people to Christ has a great reward to it. And I'm pretty sure, in fact, I'm solid sure. I know for certain that it means this. Matthew 25, 21, where the master gave his servants different, different talents to use, and the ones that used them and gained more talents... His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. You get a prize. You get a crown. You get something that's going to last forever, and it's going to be great because you won the prize. You run, you ran, and you won the prize. You get an eternal crown of reward. That's the motivation here. Run your Christian life, live your Christian life to win it. Not just to jog and get to the other side, but to win it and get a crown, get a reward, get something that's, uh, well, like I, like I said, I don't know exactly what it means. Something more than just getting to the other side, but something to win. When you win, you win. You get to shout and jump up and down and act crazy or something. You don't whine. You jump on top of the car and spin it out. You do things like that because you won. Paul says in verse 26, Therefore, because that motivation is at place, in place, I want to win. I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. When Paul's describing his own race, he's describing himself in his own fight. He's describing himself, I want to win the race. Because I want to win the race, these things are in play in my life. And he's not just talking about him winning the race, he's applying them, telling us to run the race like him. When he says, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. He means, so you don't run like a man running aimlessly. You don't fight like a man beating the air. If you're going to win the contest, you've got to stay on the right course. You've got to focus on the target. Not aimlessly. The word means without purpose. Unintentionally. Lack of certainty. People who 
run aimlessly, have no idea what they're even doing. Not saying they're not saved. Not saying they haven't believed in Jesus. They're just running, don't, even have, don't know what they're doing. Don't know what they're doing. And when you're fighting, you can't just swing at whatever. You got to ball up your fists and you got to punch at the guy's face. And you hope you hit him in the face hard enough, enough times that he falls down and quits swinging back at you. That's how you fight. You don't just swing wildly, you swing with a purpose to knock him out. That's what Paul's saying here. You've got to punch. Aggressively beat the enemy. Aggressively beat your opponent. Aggressively outrun the opponent. It's a race to win. It's a fight to win. And you don't win if you don't aim at the finish line. You don't win if you don't aim at your opponent's face. You can't live the Christian life if you don't have clear direction. We're not just wandering around here as Christians. We want to be like Christ, don't we? We want to live like him. We want to be like Jesus Christ. We want to act like him. We want to think like him. We want to be like him. We want to have a genuine sanctification in our lives, a genuine godliness, a genuine holiness, a genuine maturity in Christ. You want to be a, a true, strong, mature Christian. That's your life. And that takes discipline. That takes self-control. Paul says in verse 27, No, I beat my body and make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Winning is Paul's motivation. Winning is his first primary motivation. In this illustration of the, of the race and the fighter, his goal, his aim, his purpose is to win it. But he also has a secondary uh, motivation, and that is to not be disqualified. That's equally his challenge. That's equally his motivation. The word means to be fraudulent, misleading, having no value, worth nothing, not approved. I don't want to live my Christian life so that I preach this gospel to other people to get a prize and then I don't win and I don't get a prize. I got disapproved. I got disqualified. I was a fraud. I was misleading. You know why? Because I didn't have any self-discipline. I didn't have any self-control. I didn't really try to win the race. I didn't finish the race very well. Paul was concerned, seriously, Paul was concerned to not lose his rewards in Christ for preaching the gospel. I think Paul wanted a reward. Paul was longing for the prize. Paul was longing for the crown. And that crown, that prize, that reward is diminished by our lack of self-discipline. That crown, that reward, that prize is gone. Because you didn't discipline yourself to win it. You didn't get it. We talked about this back in chapter 3, and I, I'm running out of time. I'm running out of time now, but I wanted to say it. You, chapter 3 is talking about wood, hand, stubble. That's going to get burned up. You'll escape through the fire. You'll escape as though one who just gets through the fire, but you lose all, your, all the stuff you built. But if you built with gold, silver, and precious stones it lasts same thing here and Paul said I beat my body I beat my body I make it my slave you know most people are slaves to their bodies and Paul makes his body the slave he tells it what to do not the other way around self-discipline, self-control, spiritual discipline involves um, ex doing things negatively too. 
I said it a while ago, you don't, you don't see athletes going to a pizza party. Not until the season's over. We won the race, we won the Super Bowl, we won, the, we won it, do we finally go get to eat some of Grandma's cheesecake? But not until then. Paul says he beats his body. The word literally means he beats it. Now, many people have taken that and they've gone crazy with that as uh, ascetics. They go and they beat themselves with whips and, and um, rocks and glass and knives, cut themselves, pummel themselves literally with a whip, thinking that's going to make them holy. I don't, Paul doesn't mean that, not in the way they're doing it. But he does mean keeping your body under self-control, discipline. You deprive it of the luxuries and the things that would keep you from winning the race. We read this one earlier, Hebrews 12, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. It's not um, that you merely wrestle with sin. We all wrestle with sin. Everyone's got something they're wrestling with. You have to kill it. You don't just wrestle with it, you kill it. You, you wipe it out so that it's not going to make you lose anymore. It means you have to have self-control so you'll win the race. You kill it. It's making you not win the race. You kill it. Colossians 5, Colossians 3, verse 5, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, your flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Romans 13, 14, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Don't even think about how you can satisfy your flesh. Don't think about it. Clothe yourselves with Jesus. Paul in Galatians 5, 16, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Peter writes, 1 Peter 2, 11, as aliens and strangers in the world, abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. That's the stuff you've got to put off. Those are the things you've got to stop doing. You've got to put away the things that Wage war against your soul, the things of your flesh, the things of your sinful nature. Don't look at, don't read, don't even move in the direction of things that tempt you and feed your desires. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, or don't dwell on, don't rehash events in your life that fuel your discontent and your bitterness toward things and circumstances and other people. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Everybody here got somebody they don't like? Don't think about it. It'll just make you lose the race. Don't review, um, and of course some of this stuff is, I'm preaching to me, I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to me. Don't review the things that make you angry. Everybody have triggers? Easy triggers? Anybody? It's just me. Easy triggers that make you mad. And they make you mad and they make you say things you shouldn't have said. Because they were in your heart. You got mad and you blew it. You didn't win the race. You got to stop that. You know what your struggle is. You know what your struggle is. Stay away from the things that cause you to lose that struggle. Beat that stuff out. Beat it out. Discipline yourself for godliness so you can win the race and not be disqualified. That's what Paul's saying here. It says in 1 Timothy 4, 7, have nothing to do with the godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. I like this too. Train is a, is a Greek word, uh, gymnazo, we get gymnastics from it. As a Christian who believes that Jesus Christ died for your sins, discipline yourself like an athlete in a gym so you can run to win the prize and not be disqualified from receiving that prize because of a lack of self-control. That's the sermon. That's the Christian life. That's what the Christian life is, a race. 
What would be different in your life if you raced to win? What would be different in the life of our church if you raced to win? All of us, I'm talking about all of us together, but it's just you, yourself, you, whoever I'm talking to today, talking to all of you, talking to me, but if you just raced your, lived your life, Christian life so you could win the race, how would that change in a really good way South Strand Community Church? Because you raced to win. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful that you have given us this opportunity, this time today, where we can study your word and hear you speak to us. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, preserving it to this day for us. I pray, God, you would work grace in all of us here by your spirit so that we would put these things into practice and live our lives in a way that honors Christ and wins the race. Let, let that be our mindset. Let that, let that be the way we think. We want to win. I want to win. Work that grace in us, Father. I beg, please. Do that so Jesus will be glorified in all of us. I ask it in his name, for his glory, his honor. Amen.